You're listening to a message from New Beginnings Lakeside Church. Today's speaker is Pastor Doug Horner. Well, good morning. It's a blessing to be with you this morning as we're hopping back into our study in Matthew, uh, verse by verse, of course. And we're in Matthew chapter 5 today, so if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 5 in your Bible or on your phone or wherever you uh, access Scripture... And I want to actually begin today by reading a quote you may be familiar with. And here it is. It says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, of course, we know where that comes from, right? If you took history in elementary school, you know that that's from the Declaration of Independence. And that declaration is sort of a manifesto or kind of a written statement of what America is all about. If you wanted to learn what the kingdom of America really values and what the kingdom of America is really all about, well, then that would probably be a good place to start. And if you wanted to learn what the kingdom of heaven is, all about, if you wanted to learn what the kingdom of God that's ruled over by King Jesus is all about, well, then the place you'd want to start would be the Sermon on the Mount. It's sort of a manifesto of the kingdom. And for the next 10 weeks, as we trek through the Gospel of Matthew, we're going to be looking at chapters 5 through 7, which are Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's been said that if you took all the good advice for how to ever live, uttered by any philosopher or psychiatrist or counselor, took out all the foolishness and boiled it all down to the real essentials, you would be left with a poor imitation of this great message by Jesus. See, the Sermon on the Mount is often considered one of the mountain peaks of Scripture. In fact, John Stott said this about it. The Sermon on the Mount is the part of Jesus' teaching that is best known, least understood, and least obeyed. And that's a shame because Jesus said specifically in Matthew chapter 7, at the end of his sermon, in the concluding remarks of all that he had said, he said, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man. Who, put, who built his house on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Now, I can tell you that for the next 10 weeks, we're going to be hearing the words of Jesus, the words of his Sermon on the Mount. But the question really for us is, will we do them? Will we do them? But we put them into practice in our lives. Now, with that being said, let's set the scene here. Jesus has chosen a busy fishing town called Capernaum to be the center of his public ministry. It's a place where there's a lot of commerce happening. There's a lot of foot traffic as people go north through Galilee and as other people come from north through south through Galilee. So it's a busy place, especially compared to where he grew up in Nazareth. And we've just seen in chapter 4 a couple weeks ago that he's called four fishermen to be his first disciples. There's more still to come. But really what has begun happening is as he's begun preaching and teaching in the synagogues, and especially as he's been healing people, he's really begun to, to grow in his popularity. His fame has exploded. And people all across the nation, from the north in Galilee to the south in Judea, and even outside the borders of Israel to the Gentile regions, they know who this Jesus guy is. And they're curious about him. And so he has crowds of people that are following him around. And it's with that in mind that we come to chapter 5, where it says that seeing the crowds, he, that is Jesus, went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now, in that time, when a, a teacher or a rabbi 
was getting ready to teach, they would sit down, and they would teach from a place of sitting, and, and everyone else would stand up. So I thought, maybe we could try that sometime, um, if you guys would be into it. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. See, now we've reversed it somehow, right? And it's good for you guys, not as good for me, but that's okay. So Jesus sits down because he has something to teach. And notice who came to him. Notice who this sermon is going to be delivered to. He's not going to preach this to the masses, to the crowds. But on this occasion, he's going to preach this sermon to his disciples. And that's an important key for us this morning, that the Sermon on the Mount is given to Jesus' disciples. Now, why is that important? Well, David Guzik summarizes it like this. He says, the Sermon on the Mount doesn't tell us how to get to heaven so much as it tells us what life should be like for those who are on their way to heaven. In other words, the sermon is not a list of do's and don'ts that you need to follow if you want to get into heaven. Rather, the sermon is more of a roadmap, a guide for those who have already committed themselves as disciples of Jesus. They're on their way to heaven, and Jesus is now teaching them what it looks like to be a citizen of his kingdom. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. So we don't want to turn this into a legalistic list, right, of things we have to do and not do to win God's favor and approval. But rather, what we want to view this sermon as is Jesus' instructions to us, his disciples, on how he wants us to live as his disciples. And so it says in verse 2, he opened his mouth and he taught them. Notice what the first word of his sermon is. This is the introduction. He taught them saying, blessed, blessed. That's what he opens his sermon with. In fact, this portion of the Sermon on the Mount is often referred to as the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, and basically what they are, are Jesus' description of the blessed life. That's why we've titled our study this morning, The Blessed Life. Because if we hear what Jesus has to say, and we put it into practice, we will find ourselves as blessed people. We will learn what it means to truly be blessed according to Jesus' definition of the word. And before we even get into it, I want to talk about this word, blessed. What does it mean? See, in our culture today, it's just kind of become a word that's synonymous with lucky. I'm lucky. Maybe it has a little spiritual twist to it, you know, like Bruno Mars in his song. He's like, hashtag blessed. You know, if you go on Twitter, people are like, hey, look at all these amazing things about me. I'm just blessed. You know, it's like a humble brag moment a little bit. They post a selfie at the gym, you know, like showing their, their bicep, and they're like, you know, I'm just blessed. You know, that's what it is now. That's what blessed has become. What does the word blessed actually mean? Well, it's a word that simply means, oh, how happy. Oh, how happy. And it describes the state of those who have received the favor and approval of God. Blessing is something that comes as a result of what God does in a person's life. And it speaks of being in a state of happiness, not temporary, you know, fleeting happiness, but a true depth, a, a true joy, a true lasting happiness. This is what Jesus is describing. Now, by show of hands, who does not want to be blessed? Right, none of us, right? We all want to be blessed. We all want to live the blessed life. So we'd be wise to hear what Jesus has to say about it. Here are three important truths that we need to know about the Beatitudes, about the blessed life before we even get into them. First of all, the blessed life is available right now. As Jesus goes through these Beatitudes, and there's eight of them, he's, here's what he is describing. He's describing what it is to be blessed, to be happy. But I want you to notice, if you look there in verse 3, and really if you scan the whole list of Beatitudes, he doesn't say, blessed will be. Someday, if this is true of you, one day the blessing will come. You'll live the blessed life one day. But he said, blessed are, right? The, he's using the present tense because he wants us to know that regardless of whatever our situation is in life, 
regardless of whatever is going on, if these things are true of us, we are blessed right now. The blessed life is available to us right now. Secondly, the blessed life is found where we least expect it. Now, our general definition of the world of the word blessed, and if you ask the culture what their definition of the word blessed is, you know, the cultural beatitudes might sound something more like this. Blessed are the rich. Blessed are the powerful. Blessed are those who have a real good job. Blessed are those who are famous and popular and who have good looks. Blessed are those who are healthy and have all the money they could hope for. But Jesus' definition of blessed is very different. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are mourning. Blessed are those who are meek. Blessed are those who are persecuted. In other words, what he's doing is he's taking what we would expect to describe the blessed life, and he's turning it upside down on its head. And such is the way of the kingdom of heaven. It's an upside-down kingdom in, in many ways. The first shall be last. And those who the world would look at and say, man, that is not blessed. Jesus says, no, those are the blessed ones. Because blessing is actually found where we least expect it. Thirdly, the blessed life is a result of what God will do. It's a result of what God will do. It has nothing to do with luck has nothing to do with blind circumstance, fortunate chances, things going your way in life. Blessing is a direct result of the work of God in your life. And as Jesus describes these beatitudes, he's going to describe them as being blessed because this is the reason, this is the why, God is doing something on their behalf. God is doing something on their behalf. And many of the things that God is doing are true in an already but not yet kind of sense. In other words, God, you know, comforts those who mourn right now, partially. But there's still going to be pain. There's still going to be things that we deal with that are difficult. And we can look forward to the full manifestation of the kingdom when mourning is literally just wiped away. When comfort is the complete and total experience. So, in a sense, the Beatitudes describe not only what we can experience in part now, but what God will do completely in the future. All right, with that being said, let's look at these Beatitudes. We've got eight to look at this morning, so we're going to go right through them here. Verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, simply put, to have a poverty of spirit is to have an attitude of humility that acknowledges your complete need for God. It's you acknowledging your complete dependence upon God, your complete spiritual bankruptcy apart from him. David described it this way in Psalm chapter 70. He said, but I am poor and needy Hasten to me, O O God, you are my help, you are my deliverer, O Lord, do not delay. Now, materially speaking, David was a king, right? He wasn't poor. But he recognized in his spirit and his inner being that he needed God, that God was his deliverer, that from God came his salvation. See, the heart of the one who is poor in spirit simply says, God, I need you. And this is the opposite attitude of the world that we experience today. I mean, I was scrolling Facebook this week, and I came across this quote. I don't even know who said it. All I could find was her Twitter handle. I couldn't find her real name. Her Twitter handle is Homemaker Susan. Okay, so I don't have the the words of a profound, well-known theologian for you, but what this lady had to say was really good. She said, the gospel sounds very strange to a generation that has been told that they are perfect, that loving themselves is virtuous, that their heart is always right, and that nothing is more important than being happy. Now, does that describe poverty of spirit? See, the things that our culture tells us today is, look, 
you're the best. You're amazing. And all you need to do is figure out exactly who, discover who you are, and then live that out. And who knows what that could mean? So people live lives that are totally contrary to what God would have for them because they're trying to follow after their own hearts, which Jeremiah says are desperately wicked. That's what Romans tells us, that the truth about us is that we're more messed up than we could ever imagine, and yet we're more loved than we could ever hope for. And that's the good news of the gospel. Poverty of spirit. It's a requirement if you want to be part of the kingdom of God because without it, you'd be far too proud to come to God and ask for his help. And the reason that Jesus tells us this first, this is the foundational beatitude, is because only once we are poor in spirit can the other beatitudes be true of us. You know why? Because as we're going to see, you know, these things don't come naturally to our hearts. And if we're going to be people who fit this description that Jesus gives us, then we need God's help. We have to have poverty of spirit. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, mourning in and of itself isn't uniquely Christian. Everybody mourns, whether they're Christians or not, whether they're disciples of Jesus or not. But what's unique about what Jesus describes is that disciples mourn the things that God mourns. They mourn the things that God mourns. For example, they mourn the devastating effects of sin in the world. We look around at the world, we see things are not as they should be. You know, we, we get, turn on the news and, you know, just a couple weeks ago, 19 kids, two teachers shot at a school in Texas. And that should cause us to pause and mourn. We mourn the devastating effects of sin and that it separates people from God, right? Those who are unsaved. Rather than being careless towards those who don't know Jesus, we should mourn and say, God, how I want for people to come to know you. It should motivate us to go and share the gospel with them. Not only that, but those who are blessed, they mourn the sin of their own heart. They mourn the sin that drives wedges in their own relationship with God. Ephesians chapter 4, it says that sin grieves the Holy Spirit. Paul in 1 Corinthians, he reprimanded the church there because they were celebrating their tolerance of a person who was walking in sexual sin. And he said, should you be arrogant? Should you not rather mourn? We mourn the sin of our own hearts. Consider these godly examples of mourning in the scriptures. When the Israelites who returned in in the exile came back and then walked straight back into disobedience to God's law, Ezra mourned their faithlessness in Ezra chapter 10. When David sinned against God and sinned by committing adultery with Bathsheba and having her husband put to death, he came before the Lord confessing and mourning his sin with a contrite heart and a broken spirit in Psalm 51. When Paul looked at his own heart and the battle that still exists there, the struggle that he has with sin, it caused him to cry out in mourning, O wretched man that I am. And when Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus, although he knew that the mourning was about to turn into joy because Lazarus was about to be raised from the dead, before he did anything, he stopped and he wept in mourning. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 2 says that it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind and the living will lay it to heart. See, mourning helps us realign our perspective, helps us get the perspectives of eternity. And yet it says that those who mourn shall be comforted. We will be comforted. And like I said, there is a sense in which we can experience the peace and the comfort of God even now, according to Philippians chapter 4. But there is a time in the future coming, it says in Revelation 21, where he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. The time is coming when mourning is done away with. But for now, we can mourn with hope. With hope. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, what is meekness? The Greeks considered meekness to be a vice because they associated it with weakness. But meekness is not weakness. What it is is a gentle humility that is born out of confidence in God. You could be the strongest person in the world and still be meek. Jesus was. Moses was said to be the meekest man on the face of the earth in Numbers chapter 12, which, you know, he wrote that about himself. So, you know, if I'm like, hey, I'm the most humble person on the face of the earth, I'm not just kidding. He was under the inspiration of the Spirit there. So we know that what he said was true. He really was. He was the meekest man on all the earth. And there was one occasion when his sister Miriam and his brother Aaron came, and they opposed him. They led a little coup against him. Unjustly, they were really at the heart of it is that they were jealous of him. They were jealous. And they said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he also spoken through us too? And in that moment, Moses could have defended himself. And he could have said, well, where were you whenever God came to me in the burning bush? And he told me to go and free the Israelites from the hand of Pharaoh. Where were you whenever we were at the foot of the Red Sea and God told me to put my staff in the water and when I did, the water split open and the whole nation walked through on dry ground? Or where were you whenever I went up onto the mountain of God and received the law of God and the Ten Commandments? Oh yeah, that's right. You were down at the foot of the mountain worshiping a golden calf. But Moses didn't say any of those things, did he? In fact, he remained silent doesn't record any sort of response that he has. Rather, God came and defended Moses. God came and he dealt with Miriam and Aaron and their attitude. God was Moses' defender. God upheld Moses' cause. See, that's what it means to be meek. The meek trust that God will uphold their cause. And so they don't feel the need to take revenge. They don't feel the need to constantly get even or to constantly defend themselves or justify themselves. They certainly don't feel the need to step on other people to get ahead in life. They don't live with the dog-eat-dog mentality. And to the world, it looks like the meek are going to get left behind. It looks like they're going to get the short end of the deal. But God says... They're blessed because the meek are the ones who will inherit the earth. And ultimately, the full fulfillment of that is going to come whenever we come into the, when Jesus comes and he establishes his kingdom here on the earth. Right now, the kingdom's already here, right? He's ruling and reigning in our hearts. But one day, Jesus is going to come and set up an empire here on the earth. His kingdom's going to be here. And it says that those of us who have followed after him, are going to rule and reign this earth with him. And I'm calling dibs on Mayor of Destin, okay? Just so you guys know. If you find another place you want, you can go, go there, but I, I want Destin, all right? So I don't know what it's going to look like, but the meek, he says, will inherit the earth. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. See, this describes a craving, an insatiable appetite for personal holiness and to see that righteousness, that justice is being done in the world. Describes a desire for sanctification, that we would continue to be transformed more and more into the image of Christ. And how convicting it is to to read these words and really think about myself in light of that. Am, Am I hungering? And thirsting, do I have an insatiable craving for personal holiness? Do I care that justice gets done in the world? Do I care that the right thing happens no matter what narrative side I'm on? See, I think we lack hunger for sanctification oftentimes 
that we often don't care about people who are being mistreated. Now, when we're mistreated, when it affects us, well, then we hunger for some righteousness. But do we care when others are mistreated? Do we treat personal holiness as an optional add-on to the Christian life? Oh, I know Jesus. I put my faith in him. I'm going to heaven. And if I walk in holiness, then that's great. If not, then whatever. I think that the lack of a hunger and craving for righteousness is often the reason that we fail to experience the power of God in our lives. But the good news, Jesus says, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied, that God will see to it that justice has the final word, and that God will continue to mold us into the image of his son, even though like Paul, we cry out, wretched man that I am, in, uh, that I am who will deliver me from this body of death, the hope is in the words that come after, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord, that God will that he is committed to our sanctification, and that there will be a time when we see Jesus, we're face-to-face with him, and it says that we will be like him, and our sanctification will be complete. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It's pretty self-explanatory, right? Jesus told a parable about this in Matthew 18, about a man who owed a king 10,000 talents, which in today's dollars would be millions. It was a debt he could never repay, and so the king had mercy on him, and he forgave him. So what does that guy do? He turns around, he walks out, and he goes and finds a guy that owes him money. And you would think that he would say, you know what, I just got forgiven millions of dollars. I'm gonna forgive your debt. After all, this guy only owed him a few hundred denarii which was just minuscule in comparison to what he had just been forgiven. But instead, this man looked at the poor man that owed him, and he demanded payment immediately. The poor man said, just give me more time. I'll I'll get you your money. And the guy said, nope, throwing you into prison. He had no mercy on him. And so when the king heard about that, he came, he found that unmerciful servant, and he threw him into prison. Because to the merciful The psalmist said, you show yourself merciful. See, we have committed sin against an infinite God. We may not think that we're bad people. We may not think, most of us generally think to ourselves, I'm a pretty good person, right? But sometimes the gravity of the the offense that you commit doesn't have to do with the offense itself, but rather who you commit it against. You know, if you sin against your high school principal, you might get expelled from the school, but if you sin against the president of the United States, you might get expelled from the country. What about when you sin against an infinitely holy God, where you're guilty of an infinitely holy, or you're an infinitely, um, you know, heinous act, and you now owe a debt that you'll never repay, apart from God's grace and mercy and forgiveness to you in Jesus Christ, And if you've received that, if you receive his mercy, how could you not turn around and give that to the one who needs mercy? If God so richly provides for all of your needs, how could you not turn around in mercy to the one who has needs and give freely to them? Blessed are the merciful, Jesus said, for they shall receive mercy. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, the Pharisees were the opposite of this. Jesus told them in Matthew 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. See, the Pharisees just cared what other people thought about them. They cared what image they were projecting to other people. They were like those who, they come to church every week, you know, they, they look good on the outside, but inside... There's no pursuit of God. There's no love of God. There's no love of holiness and purity. The pure in heart, by contrast, they seek inner purity. They long to have God purify them, not just so that they look good to other people, although whenever your heart's clean, it's going to come out. They long to have their hearts clean 
because they know that God does not look upon the outward appearance, but rather God looks upon the heart. And here's their reward, and I love this. Jesus says that they're blessed. Why? For they shall see God. Don't all of us want to see God? Don't we want to have greater experience of God in our lives? Don't we want to have greater intimacy with Jesus in our lives and experience all that he has for us? Well, Jesus here gives you the secret to it. He says, if you want to see God, pursue purity of heart. Rid your heart of the sin that blinds you to God. That's what sin does. It has a blinding effect upon our hearts. And if your heart's all tied up and in love with sin, it's going to be hard to see God. But when you pursue purity of heart, it removes that blindness. You can see God in your life. I believe that one of the great reasons that many of us, many Christians, experience dryness, experience lack of experience, experience uh, just a, a weakness and a fickleness in our relationship to God is because we aren't pursuing purity of heart, that our motivation for doing the right things are often what other people will think of us rather than what God will think of us. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, here is what's interesting about the peacemakers. All of us want peace for the most part. Maybe some of us don't. Maybe all of us sometimes have a tendency to kind of want to gossip and create divisions, and, and that's a whole other thing. But peacemakers don't only want peace. They actually go out and they make peace. They pursue peace. They take the first step. That's what a peacemaker does. See, when God looked upon our state, he saw that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we were in rebellion against him. Did we take the first step towards him, or did he take the first step towards us? He came to us. He came to the earth. He became a human being in the person of Jesus Christ. He gave himself up for us on the cross. He made peace between the two parties. He took the first step. Colossians 1.20 says this, God made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And now we follow in Christ's footsteps whenever we become peacemakers, whenever we make peace by striving for unity rather than division. We make peace when we share the gospel with other people, right? Because the gospel is the means of peace between God and man. So when we extend the gospel to someone, we're saying, have peace with God. We make peace when we take the first steps of forgiveness, even when the other person maybe doesn't feel very sorry. Or oftentimes we like to think of ourselves as the ones who always need to be doing the forgiving, but sometimes we're the ones that need to take the first step to go and apologize and ask for forgiveness. Again, this all goes back to poverty of spirit. You'll never do these things unless you recognize your need for God, unless you humble yourself. When we make peace, Jesus says, we shall be called the sons or the daughters of God because God himself is the ultimate peacemaker. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I don't know about you, but whenever I experience persecution in life, I don't feel very blessed. Jesus says, no, whenever you experience persecution, not just because you've done something you shouldn't have done or whatever it may be, when you experience persecution for righteousness sake, when you experience persecution because you're associated with me, because you're living the way that I want you to live, well, then you're blessed. And here he circles back around. He's closing his intro up because in the first beatitude, we read that blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here again, we see what happens when you've become poor in spirit and you've allowed the, be the beatitudes to take hold of your life. Well, the world takes notice. Persecution happens. And Jesus encourages us by again saying, theirs is, present tense, the kingdom of heaven. This is what Paul said in 2 Timothy 
all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's just what's going to happen. In fact, if we never experience any persecution in our lives, it should probably cause us to stop and wonder, am I really living a godly life? Do people even know that I follow Jesus? And I'm not just talking about physical persecution, getting beat up or thrown into prison. Jesus is talking about the verbal insults. Look at verse 11. Blessed are you when others revile you, right? They're speaking out against you. They persecute you. They utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, he says, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Those who speak the words of God will always experience persecution. And when you follow Jesus Christ, you will be called a hater. You'll be called a fanatic. You'll be called a freak. You'll be called a goody-goody. People will look at you funny whenever you don't watch the same movies. When you prefer to spend your weekends differently than they do. When you don't engage in the same activities as them. They'll look at you funny when you're a student. And you are holding out for marriage. You're waiting. And they'll revile you. They'll speak all kinds of evil against you falsely. When you share the gospel, they might even say that it's inappropriate. Or that you're proselytizing and you can't do that. They don't recognize that all you want is for people to come into relationship with Jesus Christ. And, you know, a lot of this is going to happen behind your back when you're not around. And when you find out about that, and when they come and say it to your face, don't be mad at them. Rejoice. That's what Jesus says, rejoice, because great is your reward in heaven. And pray for them. Pray for those who persecute you. Now, if you're anything like me, as I was going through the the list of the Beatitudes this week, it just became very apparent to me that I fall short of these. (laughs) And you may be feeling the same way. As you read these, you may be saying, you know what, I don't feel like that really describes the the way that I am right now. And if you've recognized just how poor and needy you are and how you fail to live up to God's ideal on your own, well, then I have good news for you. Because this list of Beatitudes, like I said earlier, it's not a list of do's and don'ts to become a child of God. It's not a list of legalistic code that you have to keep if you're going to come into the kingdom. No, we come into the kingdom of God because the king came to us because the king came and he sacrificed his own life. Jesus lived out the Beatitudes. Jesus lived out the Sermon on the Mount in perfect righteousness. He was the ultimate poor in spirit, right? He gave uh, up his position in heaven. He became poor so that we could become rich. He was the one who came and he mourned the sin that he did not commit. He was the one who came and described himself as gentle or meek and lowly and humble. He came humbly riding on a donkey when he presented himself as king. He's the one who said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. He hungered and thirsted for righteousness. And the same is true of all the Beatitudes, especially the last one. He's the only one who, without cause, was completely innocent, was persecuted to the point of being nailed to a cross. He was unjustly persecuted. He was unjustly spoken evil of. He was unjustly beaten to a pulp and nailed onto a cross. But all of it was according to the plan of God so that you and I could become kingdom citizens when we place our faith in his perfect righteousness we recognize just how far short of the Beatitudes we fall, it should cause us to look to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you because you are the perfect one. 
You are the one who is completely and totally and eternally blessed. And I want these for my life, but I can't do it on my own. And the good news is that when Jesus came, he established what he said in in the book of Luke was a new covenant between God and man. It was established by his blood. And the distinguishing mark of this new covenant in Ezekiel 36, God says is this. He says, I will give you a new heart. A new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. See, if you want to live the blessed life, if you want the Beatitudes to be true of you, you're not going to be able to will yourself into it. What you need is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. What you need is the heart change that only God can provide to you. And that's available to you because of the cross. So that this list is not a list of things we must do to get to to heaven, but rather it describes what we can be when we allow Christ to live in us. So I want to encourage you to come to God, poor in spirit, to come to him and recognize your complete desperation and need for him, to recognize how you can't do anything that pleases him apart from his grace and mercy in your life, and place your faith in the Savior. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to to have all the beatitudes true of you to come to God. I always had a pastor who told me he catches his fish before he cleans them. I always loved that. He'll sanctify you. He'll change you if you'll just come to him and, and allow that first beatitude, that have that poverty of spirit, come to him in humility. And if you already have come to God in faith, if you have received Jesus Christ as the Savior, then what I would encourage you to do this week is to pick one beatitude. Read this on your own this week. Pick one beatitude and say, God, I need your help. Would you help this to be true of me? And just begin submitting that to the Lord and begin praying that God would help you and begin looking at what he's doing in your life. Keep your eyes open to see him answer your prayer, that he can transform your heart so that you live the blessed life that Jesus described here. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to understand what the blessed life is, that you told us what it means to be blessed. And Lord, we recognize how far short we fall of these things, that apart from you, we can do nothing. And oh, how we need your power, the power of your spirit to change our hearts so that we can walk in your statutes, so that we can live the blessed life that you want us to live, so that we can be the kingdom citizens that you desire us to be. Lord, I pray for those here today who haven't yet placed their faith in you, who have yet to to make that commitment to be your disciple. Perhaps they're like those who were part of the crowd that day who overheard Jesus' message. Perhaps that describes you this morning, that you've overheard Jesus' message today and you haven't made the decision yet to be a disciple, but man, you're astounded by the words that he said. If that's you, I would encourage you to come to the Savior in faith, simply to place your faith in his life, his death, his resurrection. Believe that he lived perfectly, that he died in your place, that he rose from the dead. Surrender your heart to him. And Lord, for those of us who have called ourselves your disciples, who have taken your name, I pray you'd help us to build our houses on the rock by hearing and doing. That we wouldn't simply walk out of here, hearers of your word. But Lord, help us to be doers of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.